Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. Good morning. I'm Mark Cancy, and a senior advisor at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Let me welcome you to our session today entitled Surprise in Innovative Operational Concepts, Gaining Competitive Advantage in Great Power Conflicts. Operational concepts have been widely discussed in the national security literature recently. The national security environment has changed rapidly with the return of great power competition. The community recognizes the United States as being challenged in a way that has not been since the Cold War. Although the challenge needs robust investment, we are not able to overwhelm our adversaries through overwhelming military dominance as we've been able to do against regional adversaries like Iraq. Therefore, the United States needs to think creatively about how to use its capabilities in new ways. This includes developing new kinds of capabilities that could be combined with existing forces and equipment to create powerful new combinations. Our purpose today is twofold. I'll spend a few minutes discussing uh, a CSIS report on inflicting surprise that is being released today. And then we'll follow that with a panel discussion on the broader topic of innovative operational concepts of which surprise is one. So before we move further, let me introduce our distinguished panel. Dr. Frank Hoffman is a distinguished research fellow at National Defense University. Frank is a prolific author on strategy and had the opportunity to implement that expertise when he was one of the principals drafting the 2018 National Defense Strategy. His latest book, Mars Adapting, Learning During Wartime, is forthcoming from the US Naval Institute Press. Frank is a retired Marine Lieutenant Colonel. Dr. Thomas Menken is President and Chief Executive Officer of the Center for Strategic and Budgetary Assessments. Tom is the author of many books, most recently, The Gathering Pacific Storm. His extensive government career includes service as Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Policy Planning from 2006 to 2009. He teaches at Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies and served for 24 years as an officer in the US Navy Reserve, including tours in Iraq and Kosovo. Zim Salman is an adjunct senior fellow at the Center for New American Security. Zim is a former deputy budget and policy director at the Senate Armed Services Committee. She is currently director of strategy development at Enderal Corporation. Thank you all for joining us. So I'm now gonna take about 10 minutes to discuss this CSIS report that's coming out today, inflicting surprise on our adversaries, gaining advantage in great power conflicts. And to do that, I'll screen share a set of slides. Having spent many years in the Pentagon, I've lost the ability to speak without PowerPoint. So bear with me for one minute. Okay, does that look okay? Okay. I'm gonna sprint through uh, the slides and uh, if there are questions, uh, we can answer them uh, uh, during the Q&A. The first question is why now? Why talk about innovative operational concepts and surprise? Well, the first reason is that great power competition has returned, as I noted earlier. Uh, you've seen that in the end of the Obama administration, then in the Trump administration, and likely in the Biden administration. They've also talked about focusing on uh, China and Russia. This is uh, something not just a bipartisan concern. Second, as I noted earlier, the United States doesn't have overwhelming military force, uh, especially near the homelands. Globally, the United States has unparalleled capabilities, but not everywhere. As a result, we need to think creatively uh, about such conflicts, and we need to use capabilities in new ways. Uh, finally, building overwhelming force is not an option. Of course, we do need to invest, uh, but uh, we'll never be able to gain the kind of superiority over great powers that we did over regional uh, powers like Iraq. 
Let me start with definition about what is surprise. You can see the definition here, and it has a couple of advantages. Uh, uh, the first is that someone always anticipates uh, surprise. Stalin, uh, before the uh, German invasion, had some 80 uh, different indicators about surprise. Uh, so it's not that there weren't any indicators. It was that he did re didn't react to them, so the opponents gained a major advantage. The other thing is that the uh, focus on major advantage, that is, the study looks at things, uh, uh, actions that will affect the course of the conflict, uh, not just local uh, uh, effects. This is a follow on to the earlier CSIS study coping with surprise. The conclusion of that uh, report was that surprise is inevitable. There are things that can be done to uh, reduce uh, the likelihood of surprise and, and maybe reduce its um, effects, but it's impossible to completely avoid uh, being surprised. Uh, adversaries are imaginative. And uh, the critical thing then is to uh, be resilient and to be able to cope with surprise when it does, does occur. Uh, the picture picks up the iconic uh, uh, examples of uh, one of the iconic examples of surprise, of course, the uh, attack of Pearl Harbor. And that leads to one of the problems in the literature, uh, which is that surprise is overlooked as a tool uh, to be used. The literature, as it notes, there focuses on the victim, on the intelligence family, and, and making sure that surprise never happens again. So after Pearl Harbor, of course, there were extensive uh, hearings and inquiries. Uh, this particular picture comes from the 1973 Yom Kippur War, where again, the failure to anticipate uh, and Israel being surprised led to a wide variety of uh, analyses. But that means that the literature doesn't look at how uh, a power like the United States might use surprise. The study also looks at surprise in four uh, categories that you can see here. And the point is that surprise is more than just surprise attacks, although that's a, that's a piece of it. There are other uh, elements. And that when thinking about this tool, uh, we need to think uh, broadly opening the aperture. And the project was funded by Smith Richardson Foundation, which we appreciate their uh, support. So when we look through the literature and a wide variety of historical experiences, we came out with <clears throat> seven major themes. I'm going to run through those uh, quickly here. First, as you can see, intelligence and technology create opportunities. This is a picture from the Bletchley Park and Ultra. Um, surprise just doesn't happen. It needs uh, effort uh, to create uh, opportunities. There's no getting around secrecy. Secrecy is not sufficient, but it is uh, still a uh, key component. And democracies have been able to keep secrets. When you look back through history, democracies leak like a sieve for things that have a political uh, implication. But when you talk about uh, military and operational uh, concerns, uh, democracies have done reasonably well in protecting those kinds of secrets. Uh, deception, uh, still very much a component of uh, surprise. And it gets its um, strength by uh, uh, its uh, effectiveness by playing on adversary uh, preconceptions. And then doing the unexpected or non-standard. Uh, now, uh, uh, stepping back, of course, doing the unexpected is in a sense of definition of surprise. But I'll give you two examples of a success and a failure here. Uh, the success, as you can see here, uh, Desert uh, Storm uh, striking the Iraqis uh, out in their flanks in a place that they were not uh, expecting it. Uh, a failure actually was the US plan to invade uh, Japan at the uh, end of the Second World War. Fortunately, those plans were not, uh, did not have to be executed, but the United States laid, uh, uh, developed plans to attack uh, Kyushu, the southernmost islands, and the Japanese figured out exactly what the Americans were going to do because the Americans had standard templates about uh, where they would land and uh, how they would uh, uh, you know, arrange their forces. The Japanese having experienced 
three years of US counteroffensives knew exactly what uh, the Americans were going to do and had prepared for it. Uh, generating surprises is uncomfortable. Uh, this is a picture of George Patton, of course, a very innovative and aggressive general, but uh, constantly in trouble because of his statements and his uh, actions. And the point is a broader one that generating surprise and new operational concepts is a transgressive act that goes against existing practices. And as a result, it's often very uncomfortable. But in thinking about the situation where you might use surprise or these new concepts, we have to put ourselves in the mindset of a great power conflict. And that would involve losses and, in both personnel and equipment far beyond what we've experienced uh, in the last at least 50 years, if not 70 years. So things that in peacetime, we might not be willing to consider uh, in the circumstances of a great power conflict, we uh, uh, might. The effects are temporary. Uh, adversaries always devise um, responses. Uh, here, this is, shows the crude gas mass that the Allies developed after the Germans used uh, uh, poison gas on the Western Front. Uh, and a key, a key point also is uh, that if, uh, if you've developed a new technology, don't do a small operational test to see if it works. The Germans did that with poison gas. It works spectacularly well. The problem is the Allies then start figuring out countermeasures. Uh, instead, uh, uh, operational tests should be done uh, in secret and the uh, use in wartime should be uh, massive to get a strategic effect. Uh, rarely wins wars alone that need to think about what happens next. Many of the iconic examples of surprise attack uh, Barbarossa, for example, Pearl Harbor, um, ended ultimately in defeat. And one more thing, which is a uh, surprise available to democracies also. Uh, authoritarian regimes, of course, have some advantages in terms of secrecy, in terms of control and the uh, lack of constraints. But democracies also have uh, advantages in terms that they have uh, of having more voices, being more creative, and also generating white noise. So adversaries often can't figure out what it is they're really intending to do. As with the previous study, we developed uh, vignettes. You can see here some of the uh, descriptions of the vignettes. They turned, in the last study, they turned out to be uh, unexpectedly uh, uh, popular. A lot of people focused on these because they were co concrete instances of using, uh, uh, or, or in the previous study of experiencing surprise here of inflicting surprise. I'm gonna talk about two uh, of the, whatever, 13 in the current study. Uh, privateers is a notion that the United States might issue letters of mark and send privateers out um, on the global com commons to hunt down Chinese merchant shipping uh, in a conflict. Uh, the thought being that Chinese are very dependent on overseas commerce, but the US Navy not being very large is going to be fully engaged in uh, uh, combat in the Western Pacific and isn't going to have extra ships to run around capturing uh, Chinese um, merchant ships. Another one here is the US forces raid Russian territory. You can see uh, in the Far East during a European war. And the idea there is to take advantage of Russian vulnerabilities, its geographic extent and its inability to uh, protect all of that. There's a series of recommendations here. I'm not going to walk through all of them. I'm going to focus on two of them. You know, one of them builds on this notion of surprise and new operational concepts being uh, transgressive and uncomfortable, and the need, therefore, to protect both the debate and the people associated with that so that these ideas can, um, can be developed and bubble up and be considered and not be suppressed at a lower uh, level. Uh, and the final one is about the lawyers. And that's always makes me uncomfortable to talk about bringing the lawyers into the discussion, but it's important because many, there are many uh, ethical legal issues surrounding not just surprise, but um, new operational concepts. And those need to be vetted to be sure that they uh, don't uh, um, go against uh, uh, you know, legal or uh, ethical principles, or at least that those issues are surfaced early on. So the decision makers are not making those decisions 
right on the, on the uh, eve of these uh, activities being undertaken. So uh, the report uh, will be online, the full report, it's about 130 pages. There's a short video, two, two and a half minutes that goes with it, sort of the summary and covers some of the things that I just uh, talked about. And then of course, the re recording of this event will also be on the CSIS website. And finally, I like this quote from General Grant. Uh, this, uh, he said this when taking command of the Army of the Potomac in the East, you know, which had had a very hard time against Robert E. Lee. Uh, and it's an, his exhortation to be active, to think about what we were going to do, not always to be uh, reactive. So with that, I'm going to stop the sharing and move on uh, to, to our panelists and give them a chance uh, to talk. Um, Uh, I'm going to I'm going to let uh, Frank uh, go first uh, since uh, he was visibly writing down remarks yesterday when we did our test run and I'll give him a chance to um, share those with uh, we wrote entirely different remarks this morning. <laughs> okay, over to you, Frank. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mark, for your fine introduction. I uh, really appreciate your study. I've enjoyed it. I got a lot uh, of information out of it and some insights for future research. And I'm greatly honored to be on a panel with such distinguished scholars and practitioners here in Washington, DC. Also like to thank you for the plug for my book, uh, which is actually related to your topic. Uh, my book is about wartime learning and it involves four case studies of American forces in four different wars in which in each case, uh, American services were not as prepared as they could have been and had to adapt in a costly, uh, protracted manner over a period of time for things that might have been anticipated uh, in, in each war. Their, their competencies did not match the operational context, which is inevitable uh, when we're dealing with the future, but it's something to learn from. So what I'd like to do in my comments today is talk about uh, the purpose of operational concepts and set up a foundation for our, our experts to uh, pick up on. And I'll start with a great quote from the late Michael Howard, um, a British scholar who compared the roles of service chiefs and those responsible in the policy community for shaping our military institutions. Uh, he said that they were like sailors navigating by dead reckoning, using a, a sextant as a metaphor, uh, and as a sailor pushing off from a shore into the future, you know, leaving the past behind to some degree and moving forward. He noted that one has to leave the terra firma of the last war and extrapolate from the experiences that war as you go forward. He realized that the greater that one moves into the future from the past, from your last good data point, uh, there were difficulties in getting those calculations right. Uh, the future is not foreseeable. He acknowledged the value of small wars, either from others or from our own combat experiences as navigational fixes as you move forward um, as you sailed into the fog of peace, that you could make adjustments to understand if your investments or if your doctrinal changes were putting you on the right path so that you would not be surprised in the future when you got to the far shore. Uh, he understood that there was risk involved in piercing that fog of uncertainty that exists. I think he also understood that there was far more risk in staying back on the shore and not making any change or any you know, study of the future and being stagnant uh, as the world was changing around you. So to complement our learning from our own and from other small wars, we simulate and refine our visions of the future um, with these operational concepts. Uh, we do this through a process, not just a writing exercise. It should be a rigorous, comprehensive and evidence-based uh, system that explores that future with some degree of rigor. All concepts, again, as I said, our projections, and they're all tied to critical hypotheses about the future that will unfold and the solution sets of what will work in that operating environment. As the late Brigadier General uh, Arndt from the United States Army, Dave Fast had been noted a number of uh, decades ago, quote, the operational concept is an image of combat. It is a picture, a visualization of a strategic or operational requirement and a adversary and his capabilities and the scenario by which that institution or that service is going to overcome that problem. Uh, the victory mechanisms or the creative asymmetry, the element of surprise or uh, decisive advantage that one creates with the operational concept. 
I think that's a solid definition of what an operational concept is for and the purpose, at least the principal purpose that it serves. Now, in my some 15 years in the combat development process at Quantico, I was involved in a number of uh, conceptual projects uh, and a headquarters Marine Corps serving with the, with the Commandant as well. And I, I think there's five functions that one should understand theoretically about what a concept is, is, is helping a service chief or a DOD policymaker uh, fulfill. And the first one is one of strategic leadership. All CEOs, all service chiefs, and all DOD policy leaders are in the business of balancing uh, capabilities in the present and the future. In the business literature, it's called exploitation versus exploration. Uh, this is from the work of John March. Uh, every institution is exploiting its known capabilities, its current competencies in the current tense. But you do need to devote some portion of your portfolio, your research and development efforts, your experimentation into the expo exploration of the future. And that's the principal purpose, I think, of uh, the concept business. It's a process. You're trying to balance your risk in the current and in the future and not be surprised. Uh, so that's a very strategic leadership function. The second one is one of alignment, strategic alignment. With all the services have current missions and they have current capability sets. Uh, they've been assigned missions. Sometimes those missions uh, evolve. Sometimes the context in which one has to apply uh, evolves because the adversary is doing something or you're assigned a new mission. So you have to shift and align uh, your internal capabilities, air versus ground, mobility versus strike, intelligence versus uh, ground force something. Uh, that, that function of alignment uh, is, a, is not just a budgetary process. It's also one of concept ex exploration and exploration of the future context. Uh, more important, I think something that your report has picked up on is what I call the integration function. It's not enough to buy a widget, uh, which I get from some of my uh, advocates of technology. You know, the American way of war is very technocentric and we have gained advantages from that. But as your work shows, sometimes creative concepts can also deliver advantage as well. But the most important function, I think, again, for a concept is the comprehensive integration of the application of that new technology in institutional context. And by that, I mean the development of the personnel changes, the organizational changes, and the doctrine and education that operationalizes the technology or the new capability so that it's usable. And too often we try to buy a, buy a widget and laminate it on an old operating paradigm or an outdated organizational structure and it's not effective. So again, a concept-based requirement system forces you through that conversation of what you're trying to achieve and what it's gonna take doctrinally, educationally, facilities, leadership to operationalize that capability. The fourth function is an internal change management function. You know, changes to practice and new capabilities alter the existing, I'll use the term power balance inside an institution. Uh, there are sub factions and communities within institutions, within the Department of Defense or within every service uh, that need to be accounted for. When you create the air cab division in the army in the Vietnam period, or you introduce ballistic missile submarines in the Navy in the 1950s, and you're introducing these new capabilities, you're altering the capability mix and the balances in different communities inside the service. Uh, you're challenging the culture of that service. You're, it's mask of war, the rituals, the values, the operating paradigms that it has used in the past that are either treasured and rewarded in the past. So a concept is it matures from the ideation through the gaming process to experimentation, helps stimulate and challenge ideas, it explains and justifies them, and ultimately it should validate them for practice and organizational change. So again, your point on the climate issue, being open to that challenge, being open to that stimulation is an important aspect for both leaders and the institutional cultures. Uh, all, often difficult. And it's why I think concepts as an internal change management technique is, is very, very important. The last uh, function is one of external uh, influence. You can call it political competition, but um, and one of our panelists today is often the target for some of these things. But you know, the value of a concept is explaining a service and its priorities and its value to both the nation's leadership 
to the congressional leadership and the committee. So there's a degree of competition externally. You know, we use concepts to sell the relevance of a service and its capability mix. Uh, we advertise who is offering the, the greatest foresight, who is offering the most creative solutions to pressing national priorities, and who is offering the most bang for the buck. And you see a lot of competition inside Washington about concepts of who can deliver uh, you know, the most innovative thoughts and, and the most uh, to, to the greatest operational challenges we face. And I think that function has to be recognized as well. So this is what a concept does. It serves institutional exploration to minimize surprise in the future. It helps a service chief or DOD leadership align missions and tool sets. It promotes a comprehensive degree of change rather than uh, simply introducing new technologies. And I think it explains and justifies to both internal audiences and to external audiences, uh, including particularly to Congress, uh, what, a, what a service can deliver. And with that, I'd like to close and turn over to the next panelist. Thank you. Thank you very much, Frank. Let me turn the floor over to Zim. Great, thank you. <clears throat> and um, thanks for the uh, invitation and opportunity to be on this panel. I think it's, it's quite timely. We're seeing the department as a whole really start to grapple with what this, what implementing the national defense strategy means and are starting to roll out in a lot of new operational concepts, whether it's the Marine Corps EABO or maritime distributed operations. Um, there, there's a kind of understanding across the services that we're gonna have to change. We're gonna have to change how we think about future warfare and how we fight. And I think this report um, in this event quite timely in sh shaping how, how they're gonna approach a lot of these things. I'm gonna focus mainly on um, technology and how technology is gonna impact a lot, some operational concepts. Um, tying back to some of the themes that you brought up as well, but probably more kind of practical examples of how we see technology changing. I think that um, it is a an added challenge, um, not only in changing how we fight, but the technology that we're about to inject in the military is actually going to be quite of a leap ahead. The um, This is not slightly more stealth weapon systems or slightly longer range weapons. We are talking about technology that wasn't necessarily developed in the labs that the military saw 10, 15 years coming, but are things that were developed outside commercially um, they're going to have a pretty outsized impact on how we think about our own weapon systems and therefore how we fight and understanding how all of that comes together is going to be a pretty significant challenge for, for the department. Um, before I actually get into technology and how, and how it impacts operational concepts, I do want to mention that um, one of the key things I think is critically important as the department thinks about kind of the future fight is this concept of a credible combat capable force that's that's um, forward or present in theater. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time on it. There's actually um, other folks who spent much more um, time thinking through um, writing reports that that do a great job explaining um, this concept, whether it's Chris Doherty or at CNAS, A New Way of War, or even uh, Dr. Mankin has done great work on this at CSBA. Um, it's, it's worth just emphasizing that um, it is critically important to have credible force that's forward present that can deny an adversary's objectives. Um, technology does not overcome this challenge. It can help, but it's not going to be a silver bullet in any way. And so a lot of the things that I, um, I am going to talk about um, kind of require this, require this concept to be implemented. And the reason I bring it up is because it's actually the hardest thing to implement, both politically and logistically. Being able to shift our focus and, and um, move away from this idea that you're going to mobilize um, and bring to bear a large force, you know, a couple weeks or months later um, is not something that um, I think is going to be viable in the future. And so it's something I, I wanted to emphasize um, and really recommend um, folks look at 
kind of those various reports, um, I think they're, they're quite critical. Um, on, on technology specifically, um, there, there's been a fair amount of technical um, advancements that I think are gonna impact um, two things I wanted to touch on specifically. The first is um, what I would call a shortened kill chain. And then the second is collaborative autonomy, which people um, often call swarming. Um, I think it's also one of the vignettes in your in your report. Um, on on short and kill chain, um, it's it's clear PGMs over the past decade, couple of decades have just become ubiquitous, and so it's not enough to have longer range weapons. Um, but to really gain an advantage, you have to be able to shoot faster and shoot more often. And this is really where technology comes into play. And we've seen the department embrace this concept. We see it in JADC2, for example, or Air Force's ABMS, this idea that you can kind of connect sensors and shooters together. And the reason why this is taking um, or become so popular across the services is because the technology has just become ready, readily available to make this happen. And there's, there's a handful of technologies in particular that I want to mention. Um, the first is this combination of machine learning and AI with modern day computing power. And this allows you to do or process immense amounts of information um, at the edge. And so rather than having a human stare at a screen um, going over data that's been piped back to a centralized area, you can process all of the sensor data on the platform almost instantaneously. Um, and because modern day CPU GPUs are much smaller and exponentially more powerful, you can do this on the platform. And so there's this idea of having large um, ISR cells or C2 cells that have centralized data with racks of servers is actually not necessary. Moving forward, a lot of this data can be processed using machines um, on platforms. And machines, frankly, actually do a better job of processing a lot of these, a lot of the sensor data. Um, humans, for the most part, are going to miss things. Um, we don't. We actually can't view all of the sensor data that we collect. But machines are actually much more effective at all of this. So, if you take these, if you take these capabilities, AI, ML, of um, to to process sensor data, um, and and advanced computing, um, and you you overlay it with interoperable machine and machine communications. What it allows you to do is condense the kill chain from you know, what typically can take hours to even days to seconds and minutes. You can go from a detection to a track and to a command for a fire um, in mere you know, seconds if you have the right policies or minutes if you, if you need um, the uh, a higher level of humans on the loop. This idea that um, somebody is going to hand enter in target information into Merck chat for somebody else to pick it up and action on it is not necessarily how we should be fighting in the future. And so with faster kill chains, you should be able to, you know, in theory, you'll be able to strike assets faster and um, strike it while you have custody of, of the actual asset. Um, what it also allows you to do is it allows you to just connect a variety of sensors and shooters, regardless of domain, and more importantly, regardless of service. So you can imagine a, a day where an airborne uh, radar picks up an adversary aircraft, and that track can be passed to an Air Force fighter with air-to-air -air missiles, a shipborne SM-6, or um, land-based Patriot battery. And it's really just a policy question about how that track is is handed off. What this ultimately means is that we don't have linear kill chains anymore, that you've created a very dynamic mesh network of sensors and shooters um, that are much more resilient. You don't have um, a single um, weak link. So your entire defensive system is not reliant on the survivability or of one or two radars, but um, is resilient and can uh, rely on other sensors to remain uh, to maintain target or custody. Um, it also allows you to make decisions much much faster. 
Um, and more importantly, if you use edge computing properly, um, you, can move, you can actually move away from these centralized C2 nodes. Now you have a massive amount of information that is available on a couple of laptops instead of the more traditional brick and mortar command center. It allows you to move and to make decisions faster um, and at much lower levels if, if that's what the department is willing to do. Um, the other, the other uh, technology that I wanted to touch on was collaborative aut autonomy or swarming. Um, it's, you know, I, I, I think it's becoming more clear that stealth is probably not a long-term solution. Um, it's getting much more expensive and uh, dicey um, to imagine scenarios where we can penetrate into enemy territory. So the answer, a lot of people have decided the answer is mass to overwhelm um, the adversary with uh, a large number of assets that um, create a much more resilient force. And, uh, and the swarming technology relies on the same, the same technology as I talked about for JADC2, um, edge computing, um, being able to process sensor data on platforms, um, rapid machine machine communications. Um, all of these things allow operators to manage multiple systems. And so you're flipping this narrative of having a dozen uh, airmen fly a UAV to having one being able to manage 10, 15, or 100 UA, UAVs depending on, on policy. Um, and so really what you can, you can imagine how this is being used, you can have, 50 to 100 UAVs um, in an area with only a handful of operators and they can um, automatically um, detect and track targets. They can cue one another to follow targets if they, for example, um, are running out of fuel and we need, need to return to base. Um, they can pass targets or strike um, information between one another. Um, and or uh, detect and maneuver around threats. Um, this can be done with machines um, and really lower the burden on the operator to, to manage all of these things. And at the end of the day, what you end up having is a much more resilient capability, whether it's ISR or strike, it's highly dynamic. Um, if the department can get to low cost systems, you're also gonna impose a much higher price on the adversary to defend themselves, right? Um, uh, you know, ideally you'd wanna get these systems to be less than a weapon system or a missile of the adversary. And that way um, you're, you're flipping and kind of, you're on the right side of the cost curve, essentially. Um, so both of these concepts, not new. Um, the, the services are uh, very much um, going down this path. It's whether it's Air Force's LCAT concept or the Navy's UUV concept, um, but they're still very, in very early phases of, of development. And what I, would, um, what I would say is both of these technologies are available now. Um, and we should stop thinking about them as five to 10 years away and start thinking about them as available today. And what the department actually needs to do is to really start and increase the experimentation of, um, of what things like JADC2 and swarming means for operational concepts, because the second and third order effects of these are actually fairly significant. Um, if you can now cue, um, an army Patriot battery or um, a standard missile from a ship, you know, who is ultimately responsible for air superiority and how do those missions or roles roll down to the various services? Um, it's no longer as simple as thinking of, well, the Air Force is responsible for air superiority. Um, if information is available to a range of of um, folks that are forward and on the ground do, um, who's ultimately responsible for making um, or giving commands? Um, can we push them down to lower levels and can we uh, have them more forward position? I think- Okay, Zim, I, I appreciate it. I think we need to move quickly here. Sure. Um, so, I mean, and, and so just to wrap up, right? I think um, it's very important to be 
the four presence piece is key. I think I think that's you know something that needs to be emphasized. But um, on the technology front, it's available today. Um, we need to start thinking about it as is as it being available today. And um, it's we're really not going to get the full utility of it until we start truly experimenting with it. Okay, thank you very much, Zim. Uh, and now let me turn it over to uh, Tom Menken. Uh, thank you, Mark. And it's a, it's a uh, first off, congratulations on a, on a on an excellent report. And it's it's a timely topic. It's a topic that uh, has been of great interest to, to me for a long time, and should be uh, of of great interest to a lot of to a lot of folks. And it's a real real pleasure to share the uh, the virtual stage with with Frank and and Zim. And I think you'll see um, echoes of their their comments in in mine. Um, and to really start things off, I really want to bring to the forefront something that has been underlying this entire discussion. And it's the basic fact that wars are infrequent, they're episodic, they occur at uh, often unpredictable times, and each war is unique, uh, unique circumstances, unique adversaries. Um, and yet war is the only way for militaries to figure out decisively whether they're effective or not. And, and I think that pervades our discussion of surprise and it should pervade our discussion of the development of, of new, new concepts. So with that as, as, the, as the launching point, I wanna offer two equations and then bring it back to concepts, doctrine, and experimentation with, it, with a heavy emphasis on the experimentation. The first equation is about surprise and uh, the relationship between the surpriser and the surprise Z or the, or, or the target, right? So su surprise, successful surprise is the result of a relationship between uh, the party that is trying to surprise and the party that uh, is there seeking to surprise. Now that's kind of basic, right? But let, let's just unpack that a little bit more. Um, everything we've been talking about in terms of new uh, technology, in terms of new concepts, new doctrine, these things take time, even for the, the most uh, you know, uh, uh, efficient military in the world. They take time, involves lots of people, lots of activities. Um, and so from a certain perspective, these things shouldn't be a surprise. And yet we know historically states, militaries are surprised, right? And so part of understanding surprise is about understanding what we do and what we should do to inflict surprise upon our adversaries. Part of it's also about understanding our adversaries and, and their propensity to be surprised. And oh, by the way, it's also about understanding ourselves so that we don't inflict surprise upon ourselves. And that's, that's kind of one, one of the um, threads I wanna pull on in just a minute. So that's, that's equation number one. Equation number two um, is about surprise and not surprise. Um, it's about our decisions about what to reveal and what to conceal. So far, we've been talking about mainly concealing information to inflict surprise, to obtain operational advantage. And, and that is, um, that's important. It's a perfectly worthwhile approach. At the same time, however, uh, we have to acknowledge that that which we conceal, whether it's doctrine, whether it's technology, cannot deter. Uh, it's the logic, you know, so wonderfully uh, uh, laid out in uh, in Doctor Doctor Strangelove by uh, by Stanley Kubrick with the with the Soviet uh, doomsday machine, which was supposed to be the ultimate deterrent, except nobody knew about it. And um, we can think that that's very funny. And again, Strangelove's a, a wonderful a wonderful uh, movie. Um, it's funny, but it's also it's even funnier because it wound up being true because the Soviet Union actually did develop. Uh, it, its version of the doomsday machine. Uh, uh, and we only found out about it afterwards after the end of the Cold War. So uh, there's a good, uh, a good uh, natural experiment in, uh, in the failure of deterrence through concealing something. Now our, our, our adversaries, our competitors, I think have shown a great proficiency in selectively disclosing information uh, to have a strategic effect. And again, whether it's uh, the Russians in uh, revealing their new suite of nuclear delivery capabilities 
whether it's the Chinese in concealing and then revealing a, a whole generation of new weapons. So we need to understand that. Um, first, first and foremost, because we and our allies are, are the target uh, of those efforts by competitors. We also need to understand it uh, to the extent that we may want to adopt a, uh, a similar, and I'll say more disciplined approach to what we reveal and what we conceal. We need to think about instances in which we would want to purposefully inflict surprise uh, upon an adversary and circumstances under which it might make sense to actually reveal a capability um, in advance of a, of a conflict in order to deter. So those are, the, those are the two equations. And I think where that comes together is in the development of concepts and doctrine and with, with experimentation. Um, as Zim mentioned, you know, each, of the, each of the services uh, is going about developing new concepts, new doctrine. I think with, um, you know, with, with various levels of, of um, institutional buy-in, and I think with, with uncertain results at this point, I'm just agnostic in terms of the, the results. Um, but given, given the base condition that I laid out, given that wars are infrequent, they're episodic, they're all different, one of the things that we need to do is we need to avoid self-surprise. We need to avoid surprising ourselves on the battlefield. And um, you know, to, to Frank's earlier point, I think development of do do, new doctrine and concepts is a way to do that, is a way to make sure that our forces are fit to the characteristics of contemporary warfare. Well, how do we do that? Well, one, one of the ways we do that is through vicarious learning, right? By studying the only experience that we have, even if it's not ours, studying modern wars and trying to figure out um, what works and what doesn't. You know, Zim talked a lot about uh, unmanned systems, autonomous systems. Well, um, we're not the only ones developing them and, and others have actually been using them. So we need, to, we need to learn from that experience. But we also need to gain that experience ourselves. Um, I'm not advocating us uh, launching wars to, uh, uh, to learn, <laughs> um, even if the, the Spanish Civil War was a great uh, a proving ground for uh, uh, the Nazis, the Italian fascists, and the, and the communists. Um, but the closer, you know, closest thing we can probably come to that is realistic training and experimentation. And so to, to echo Zim, I, I do think that realistic training and experimentation really is crucial to preventing self-surprise, among other things. Um, but that's not a, a straightforward matter. We think about modern war, contemporary war, what are we talking about? We're talking about operations over very large distances, um, whether we're talking about projecting forces or long range fires. We're talking about operations across domains, land, sea, air, not to mention space, cyberspace. <laughs> We're talking about operations across the electromagnetic spectrum. We're talking about uh, the, the increasing use of unmanned systems. And yet, if you look at the training uh, and exercise infrastructure that we have, say, in the United States, whether in the continental United States or uh, to include um, the uh, uh, Alaska, Hawaii, Pacific territories, um, it's not completely suited to that task. Now, during the Cold War, we, we built a pretty impressive um, training and experimentation infrastructure in the continental United States, linking uh, even you know, East Coast Army and, and, and Marine bases all the way to Fort Irwin and, and 29 Palms. Um, I think we need to be thinking in those terms um, in the Western Pacific and, and building out the, the training and experimentation infrastructure there so that we can actually gather the types of information uh, that we need, that we can experiment, that we can train, that we can prove out uh, or prove wrong new concepts and avoid uh, self-surprise. Uh, I think the innovation efforts that we have uh, ongoing are good. Some of them are likely to succeed. Some of them are likely to fail. Um, it would be better for us to know uh, and to determine the failures in advance uh, of, of a future war rather than on the, the battlefield in a future war. So with that,
thanks for the stimulating uh, report. Thanks for the stimulating discussion. And, and I look forward to, uh, to our discussion going, going forward. Well, thanks a lot, Tom. Let me start with a question that comes out of uh, some submitted by the audience and I think is on many people's minds, which is if you had to give advice to the incoming Biden administration, uh, what would it be in regard to uh, operation, in operational concepts? And we'll start with Frank and then we'll go around. Frank, you're muted. Yeah, uh, thanks. Great question. Uh, it just picks up though, right, right where uh, everybody left off, I think, in their comments today. Uh, I would encourage, because of the nature of the technologies, because of the nature of the advantages gained by cross-domain capabilities, a greater emphasis on joint concepts and a greater emphasis on joint experimentation and agree with Tom that you know the, the infrastructure to do that doesn't exist. There have been some key changes in the joint staff structure, personnel changes, analytics, uh, some, some uh, halting steps into uh, war gaming uh, that can be accelerated uh, to get at the greatest advantages for the least cost. I believe we're going to have a period of you know, flat or slightly declining budgets over a period of time and gaining advantages in the joint context is probably the best way to maximize resources, increase objectivity uh, about the evidence that's being um, developed so that we can make the most efficient allocation of scarce resources possible. Zim? Yeah, I would agree with I would agree with that and, and what Tom said. I, I think it just bears repeating. Experimentation is key. Um, I think it's how we accelerate understanding of technologies and how we understand the implications for operational concepts. And short of that, it's it's going to be a real challenge um, to understand the implications of any of this. Okay, Tom. Um, agree. I, I think it. I think it's now's the time really to double down on. Uh, concept development and and experimentation, and I think there should be incentives uh, for that, and 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 not just you know again not just um, uh, platitudes, but but actual actual effort uh, along those along those lines. I mean, we can go back to the say the uh, the Cold War, and we can see examples of very serious efforts at experimentation and and new concept development. So whether it's uh, air, the development of air land battle by the Army, the Air Force, uh, maritime strategy by the Navy, uh, even look uh, uh, unsuccessfully in the early uh, early Cold War, the development of the uh, Pentomic Army. Those were very serious efforts, and I think it would be worthwhile to relook those historical efforts for uh, for best practices. Last thing I would say uh, is to come, and, and it really is back in line with the the issue of surprise and secrecy is the issue of classification. Um, and um, I don't have an easy answer there. It, it, it's a trade-off. On the one hand, you classify development activities, you classify doctrine uh, concepts in order to, uh, you know, to inflict surprise. But we also have to be honest with ourselves that classification can, can also inhibit the free flow of ideas. It can inhibit oversight. Um, and uh, it also bears, it carries costs with it of various types. So I think that needs to be uh, a consideration as we, uh, as we go forward as well. And that's, that's a topic that really does need to be relooked. Well, thanks. So I'm going to reinforce that in that I know the department, for example, has done a lot of war gaming. Very little of that is in the public domain. So uh, very few people know really what insights the department uh, has gained. Um, let me ask a question that came up uh, in our study and uh, I think relates broadly, which is how do you turn an innovative operational concept or surprise into uh, an advantageous strategic outcome? Uh, one problem we noted when looking at this 
in the report was that um, uh, nations tend to get victory disease. You know, when things have gone well, you know, they tend to up their uh, objectives and uh, therefore are not able to uh, you know, bring conflicts to a conclusion. Uh, last year, uh, I wrote a paper about Afghanistan, noting that our objectives for Afghanistan had increased over time, and then that was a major stumbling block to coming to some sort of uh, resolution. So let me let me put that question out there, and uh, again, start with uh, Frank. Uh, I was just thinking of a lecture I delivered at National War College, you know, the with Mary's book on successful strategies has a wonderful concluding chapter authored by Richard Hart Sinreich that talks about when do when do strategies fail and they first identified failing was over ambitious strategies that were attempting to obtain more than the time and the means that would be available and that might account for your Afghanistan uh, challenge uh, but the second most uh, frequent cause of unsuccessful strategy was a theory of victory that proved out to be erroneous, that it was a hypothesis that was not effective at uh, delivering strategic outcomes. Uh, so if you go into a war with a, a goal of a decisive operational victory is going to produce, you know, second and third order consequences, you know, the linkage between those needs to be tested. And this again, where strategic empathy, the war gaming, the employment of a red cell to understand how the adversary is going to react is, is very, very important. Uh, you know, that's to uh, get at the creation of the decisive asymmetry that should be the goal of a good strategy, um, not just purely piling on power. And as you noted in your opening comments, we're not entering in an environment, you know, in a multipolar world where the presumption is that we will have that abundance of power in the future. So again, balancing your ends and your means and getting at a decisive operational advantage you know, as a creative function in your theory of victory in a, in a military strategy is I think the critical component. Thank you, Frank. Uh, Zim? I'm not sure if I have much, much to add to that. I mean, I think at the end of the day, right, um, there is not a single operational concept and thinking through all of this, I think one of the underlying themes is you have to remain fairly flexible. Um, you know, as you mentioned, surprise isn't permanent. Um, and so as you think through what, you know, future fight might look like, I think the, the expectation is that they will change over time and that you have to have that flexible, understand the like, understanding of flexibility and the abil ability to react quickly um, as, as important factors. Thank you, Tom. Yeah. So the way you know the way I th one or one of the ways I think about surprise is that it suspends interaction between between combatants between adversaries. Right. You're the person or the side that's surprised is kind of figuratively stunned, uh, become ceases, ceases to become a a, a thinking uh, adversary, and for a time actually just sort of becomes this you know inanimate object. Um, and so, and yet it's pretty infrequent, I think as, as your report shows, it's pretty infrequent that, that surprise leads to a, a decisive outcome. It's because that, that surprise is, is temporary. And, and then, you know, success depends much more on adaptation and kind of relative rates of adaptation. So I, I think we should view that as a cautionary tale for us, um, not to expect too much of surprise in war um, but we should also, uh, uh, you know, we should also caution others uh, uh, not to uh, overvalue surprise. I mean, I think uh, as a, you know, as, as something of a student of the, uh, the Chinese way of war and Chinese theories of strategy going back millennia, they do seem to prize deception and surprise and think that you can achieve sort of, you know, decisive results um, through the use of surprise. And I think it would behoove us um, to uh, to try, you know, to try to correct the uh, correct the record there, because it seems to me that, you know, um, e even if surprise isn't uh, isn't a decisive uh, doesn't uh, lead to decisive victory, it it can actually tempt you that, that this idea that a surprise attack can 
can uh, can lead victory could tempt you to use force when maybe you shouldn't. Well, thank you. Uh, let me ask uh, an, something uh, that came up in one of the questions and that comes up a lot, which is, uh, again, with surprise and innovative operational uh, concepts, cyberspace, nano, AI, you know, the, the cutting edge of technology and new domains. Do we think about those differently or are these you know, just new domains where many of the same principles apply. Uh, let me start again with Frank. Well, I, I just think they, they may, uh, only because their physicality, I'll use that term, I guess, the, you know, we're, we're good at modeling, thinking, and gaming, I think, kinetic results. Um, we don't have as much experience, perhaps, in the electronic or cyber or information dimension about how we surprise, influence, change someone's perceptions and create dislocation or paralysis, you know, cognitively rather than physically. Uh, so I think it does need to be thought about differently, but it still requires, you know, sort of exquisite intelligence and understanding of, of how the adversary does think and what their predispositions, their strategic culture and operational cultures are uh, so I think the intellectual foundation is still the same, but I think it has to be tested entirely different. This is one of our challenges uh, for those who are relying upon uh, computer-based models built in the 1980s on Lanchester equations that are measuring you know, physical results by formula. Um, I think we're a little outdated in some of our tools. So I'll leave it at that. Thanks, Zim. I think it depends. Um, I think cyber in particular as a domain has, what we've seen is that it, it is different. It's, it's not like the other domains where um, adversaries have been involved in cyber attacks, but we don't see it nearly as escalatory as you know more traditional kinetic attack. Um, and the question is, why is that? Um, why do we view that as something that can happen kind of outside of what we would consider competition with adversaries. Um, and how do we react to that? I think a lot of that is, is more of a policy question more than anything. Um, and you know, what kind of declarations do we want to make about how we're going to react in the case of a cyber attack? But um, you know, I, I think and it, it just goes back to, to what we were all saying about experimentation in the beginning. Like these are all new technologies. And until we really start injecting it into the force, it's unclear exactly how it's going to impact any of this. Thank you, Tom. Yeah, I, I would agree with what's been said, and and because these are new capabilities and, and relatively new dimensions, you know, we're 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 forced to basically reason by analogy, and um, we we can't, you know, a we haven't experienced, you know, a a, a say a full uh, full fledged uh, cyber war. We haven't experienced. A, uh, a you know a, a, a contemporary war between great powers that includes space, cyber, large numbers of precision guided munitions on both sides. So we have to reason by analogy. We and we we can't really even in some of these cases we can't even fully experiment. Quite you know uh, um, even given what I said just a few minutes ago, right? And it's in a way it's sort of like the advent of strategic bombing in the 1920s and 30s. You had very smart. Uh, military professionals at the Air Corps Tactical School down in uh, Alabama and, and, and in Britain and in Italy and places like that, that, that reasoned logically about the impact of strategic bombing. Um, but we didn't really know what it was like until World War II broke out. I mean, uh, and, and nobody, you know, nobody in the 1920s and 30s was, was you know, carrying out a strategic bombing campaign uh, against, uh, against urban centers, right? And thank God they didn't do that. But um, uh, just as part of a, an experiment, but that's sort of what you would have had to have done to really figure it out, right? And and so I think when we're talking about space, cyber, it's a it's an analogous problem, it's an analogous challenge. Thanks. Um, I have a question that came up for Zim, which is, what is Congress's role here? You know, most of what we've discussed is really relates to the services and maybe to DoD. But of course, the co Congress is out there. They have opinions. They you know, hold the powers of the purse. What's what's their role? 
Well, I mean, you know, on paper, it's an oversight role. Right? Um, but, you know, for, you know, just from personal experience, um, you know, Congress has been the one who has been pushing the department to come up with and brief new operational concepts. This joint warfighting concept was something that, you know, was being requested by Congress, you know, for the past couple of years. Um, there was complete misalignment between the services and how they were thinking about future war fighting and even some basic assumptions um, that um, they made in thinking about operational concepts. So um, there's, there's an inherent amount of interest in understanding where the department is gonna land on all of this. I don't think that they're gonna be able to drive it in any particular direction. I, I think they'll largely defer to the experts um, on, on what that is. But the interest is because there are going to be very hard political decisions that come out of this. Where do we have our forces positioned? Um, it, more, more specifically, am I losing um, personnel from my local base, right? Um, and um, what are the trade-offs when it comes to capabilities? Which programs are going to get reduced and which ones are going to get increased? These are um, fairly hard-fought political questions that um, should, in theory, tie back to some of these concepts and some of these decisions. Um, and so what Congress should be looking for, and I think have been looking for, is justifications for a lot of these hard decisions that are coming. Thanks. Uh, I think we're down to our last question, and I, I'm, I'm going to uh, put Harlan Ullman's question out there. He um, uh, attacks the notion of great power competition, saying it's fatally flawed, that there's no definition, and it's unaffordable and unnecessary. So uh, let me turn to Frank there, and uh, I know you've uh, had conversations about this. Uh, yeah, well, it's, it comes up often. Uh, usually from very young people who grew up in a 30 year period of American you know, dominance and unipolarity. Uh, those of us who grew up in the Cold War, I think understand periods of you know, bipolar competition. Um, I think the return of a broader, more historically founded understanding of uh, great power or strategic competition uh, is, is necessary. Uh, for those who've not read Paul Kennedy's book on the rise and fall of great powers, or more recently Graham Allison's work, I'd also recommend Aaron Freeberg's work on the weary the weary Titan, on the German uh, British uh, interaction. Jim Lacey has also a book on strategic rivalries. If I can pump uh, another NDU book, we've just published a book uh, titled "Strategic Assessment 2020: Into a New Era of Great Power Competition Definitions." history, case studies, the dimensionality, the different dynamics of competition and the political, ideological, informational, military, and science technology are kind of defined and explained from a, a number of different angles and the strategy and the implications of strategic competition, the term I prefer, um, I think is, is explicated uh, there. But uh, this should be uh, not an issue of definition, it's an historical understanding uh, with grave strategic impact. Our competitors have been competing with us for a number of uh, decades uh, and, and, and acknowledge it, uh, but we've not. And uh, you know, the NDS and the NSS were not the first, the second or third, but they're the official recognition of, of this new era. So uh, a little historical context, a couple of references for folks uh, you know, to reacquaint themselves with international relations and statecraft in these multipolar periods is, is a very useful recognition. I'll leave it at that. Okay, Tom, I think we've got one minute if you want to add something to what Frank said. Yeah, look, it, it is a fact that the United States and its allies are in a competition struggle contest uh, for, you know, for uh, su supremacy in, in, uh, in, in, in Asia and really it's a contest over what the world's gonna look like with China. Wh whatever you wanna call it, um, we can argue about definitions. And I do worry that we, we, we sort of come up with a tagline and then it, it becomes an acronym and then that becomes a way of minimizing it back to, uh, uh, you know, uh, so you don't have to change things, but, but that's a fact. 
and um, we need to accommodate ourselves to that fact, and and we need to we need to deal with it. And so, whatever you call it, that's that's the world we live in, as opposed to the world we uh, used to live in or might want to live in. Well, thank you very much, panelists, for joining me. I appreciate you sharing uh, your thoughts. Uh, for those watching, the report and the short video are on the CSIS website. Thanks again for joining us. Mm -hmm.